Welcome to Southgate Today. My name is Tannis, and I want to thank you for joining us for week two of our We the Church series. Here at Southgate, it's our goal to help you unite your life with Jesus, to grow each week in your walk with God, and to inspire life around you through community. And what better series to talk about that than in We the Church. So thank you for joining us today. Now that it's fall, all of our midweek programs have started back up. We have groups every week for young adults, teens, and kids, senior kindergarten and up. Be sure to check those out, get plugged in, and join a community this fall. Another way you can stay connected is by joining our Zoom State of the Church meeting. That is tonight, Sunday, September 19th. The link's below to register. Hop in, see what we think God has planned for us here at Southgate. We have been talking about life classes as well, and one of the very first classes you can take is our Unite 101. That is coming up October 3rd in Kempville and in Winchester. It gives you all of the in and outs of Southgate and how to get plugged in and learn more about other opportunities here at Southgate. I want to take a minute to thank you for your generosity and for partnering with us. As you faithfully give to God, we are able to do so many things here at Southgate. And ultimately, God is pleased by your gifts. So thank you for being part of that. Today's topic is unity, and we are looking at Ephesians 4. And this verse stood out to me, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And I'm reminded of Jesus' words in John 14. It says, peace I leave with you and my peace I give to you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled or fearful. And how awesome is that, that we can rest in Jesus's peace as we look for unity within the church and outside of the walls. So we're going to get started. Will you take a minute and pray with me as we jump into worship and this teaching today? God, we thank you um, for your peace. And through that peace, we can have unity. Where the world says that we shouldn't, we can have your spirit with us, filling us and helping us strive for that unity that is only found with you. Pray this teaching would move our hearts to action. In Jesus' name, amen. I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, you are the one that guides my heart.
All right, we are on week two of our series, We the Church, and uh, today we are talking about something um, that, that really we need to grasp here, especially as we've journeyed over the last 18 months. And if you've watched the news, I mean, if you've read uh, the newspaper, if, you, if you're looking on websites, uh, listen to people's conversation, there are a lot of hot topics. There are a lot of polarizing issues. I mean, j just a few here, just got some pictures here. As we talk about this, we have like food insecurity. Security. I mean, that's a huge topic worldwide in how to provide for the population and uh, that, that people would have enough food in the midst of droughts and other things. I mean, if we, ha we have um, the, the events that happen in terms of racial equality here and uh, everyone kind of being on the same page, no matter their backgrounds, we have big, huge protests that have happened. We have this lockdowns and people are for lockdowns, people are against lockdowns. And then we have other countries who it seems like they're able to rally and everyone is heading in the same direction. Uh, we, we, have, uh, we have different things going on here with regards to the refugee crisis and people kind of coming out of you know, difficult circumstances and situations politically around the world and war-torn countries. I mean, the list goes on and on. I mean, the Olympics, do, do they happen? Do they not? Is it, is it worthwhile doing that? Or is it, is it unsafe? I mean, it, it continues. And, and lately with Afghanistan and what has happened, and there, there are so many issues that you almost don't even want to, to, to engage it. You almost don't even want to, to talk about it. And as I've been kind of observing this past year, I've noticed that there are some countries that are that are very divided in their approach to some of these issues. And then there are some countries, somehow, some way, who seem totally united in where they're going and where they're heading. D two distinct, very distinct situations in countries' political success and they're dealing with this pandemic and a whole bunch of other issues. What I find is that we have some countries that are unified and some that are not. Now, when we talk about unity, the community of the church, what we usually think of is things like mission and vision and purpose. I mean, these are the things that we are going to do and accomplish together, the method of how we are going to do it. Maybe even doctrine. I, I believe in this doctrine, or I associate with this thing, or I'm part of this denomination, or, or this is what I believe. And those are all fine. But what I want to talk about here today, I feel like, I feel like a warning needs to be put up. I think like a disclaimer, just so we're on the same page. And, and here's, here's what it is. It's kind of like when you watch the movies, you go to the movies and there's something that they, that they put on before, or you hear a news broadcast and they say this before. This message contains themes that may make you uncomfortable, may challenge your preconceived ideas about church, Viewer discretion is advice. All right, so you can't, I, I'm not going to take the blame here. I warned you already. This is probably going to offend someone. It, it, it might be not politically correct. It, it might step on someone's toes, uh, but I have warned you, okay? And so, so I give you the warning. I might be, I, I'm not the smartest person. I might say something that you disagree with or, or that is not right, but, but I want to do, I want to do the passage we're going to be looking at today. I want to do it justice. I want to talk about it, I want to explain it, I want to dissect it a little bit and see what we can learn as individuals who make up the church, how we behave and, and how we act for the world to see. Now the passage here today is found in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to read from 1 to 6 and then we're going to dissect it as we go. Here's what it says, as a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. First, what I want to do is just, just look at this first verse here. As a prisoner of the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. And what is the calling that, that Paul is talking about here? What, what, is, what does this even mean? What, what is he getting at here? Now, the first three chapters of Ephesians, Paul is talking about, 
about the mystery. He's, he's using this word, this, this mystery that is taking place. And the mystery is that the Gentiles, they have been included in the people of God. What once was just the Jews has now been opened to the Gentile, and it is this great mystery that he keeps referencing in the first three chapters. It was a radical idea, and it had huge consequences to both Jews and to Gentiles. Now, for the sake of simplifying things, when I say Jew, I mean a descendant of Abraham who identified religiously as Jewish. And when I say Gentile, I really just mean like everybody else, all right? So simplify things, that's kind of where I'm getting at. And, and mainly in our context, in this passage here, they, these are Roman citizens. Gentiles are, 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 are Roman citizens, and this is taking place, they're living in uh, Eastern, Southeastern Europe and in Turkey, okay? And so you have the Jews, descendants of Abraham, and then you have the Gentiles who are Roman citizens living in Turkey and, uh, and Southeast Europe. Now, Paul Main's point is that what was once divided is now reconciled. What once was separate is now kind of coming together. And it goes back to God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, 2 and 3. This is kind of where Paul is getting this from. It says this, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So God scatters the nations. God scatters the nations, divides their language as time goes on here in the early part of the world. And his intention was always to bring them back. They're scattered. They're divided. They're all over the place, all over this world, all different concepts and thoughts and beliefs and patterns. But God's, God's plan is to bring those people back. And Abraham and his line are essential to that. They were to be seed keepers, the ones who would bring the one who would unite humanity. And we know that that person is Jesus later on. Now, the central issue here in Ephesians, it is, it is mainly, mainly talking about racial uh, reconciliation. These two races, the two groups of people kind of coming together. And it's such a, such a hot topic right now. Um, with, with kind of bringing people together. And, and we can talk about all kinds of different issues that we've mentioned earlier, but there's so many divisive things in our world that can really break apart, really tear apart the church if we don't act, if we don't behave in a way that represents Jesus. And so this, this passage we're looking at here really ties into that. So to understand this better, we're going to talk a little bit about the disunity of the Gentiles and the Jewish churches. So Gentile, Jewish, these are, this is one church now. And we're going to look at this a little bit. It's, it's a little background to Ephesus and the Gentile churches. I mean, many of those are founded by Paul in his missionary journeys. He's he, people who went, who went out from those churches. They usually started with a few Jews who believed that Jesus died and he resurrected. So there are a few converted Jews here. But then usually what would happen is a bunch of Gentiles would join in. So newcomers to the church, there'd be a few Jews who would be the kind of starters, the leaders at the beginning. Then you'd have the, the Gentiles who would come in and the church was growing with these Roman citizens and, um, and, and the church would kind of explode and grow. Now, the Jews at the time, they didn't think much of Gentiles. They, they really didn't want to associate with the Roman citizens. And, and to be honest, the Gentiles really didn't want to associate with Jews. It's kind of like Leafs and Sens fans. They, they don't really want to get together. They don't really want to do that. They just bash each other. This is exactly what is taking place with Jews and Gentiles at the time in the Roman Empire. Many of the Jews, they, they continued to practice their old ways. They, they, they continued to, to kind of lean into what was taught in the Torah. And, and they continued to follow those practices. They knew the scriptures very well. And the Gentiles really didn't. They, they were new to this whole thing. And the Gentiles kept doing things that offended the Jews. They, they kept doing things that were not 
part of the Jewish tradition. And this caused division within the church on both sides, both thinking that they are better than the other side, creating division. And some would leave and they would start new churches or, or other groups. And, and because they didn't like the way things were going, they'd go and start a church over here with like-minded people. And then another one would go over here. And they, they were divided. They, they couldn't get along. And so when Paul writes this letter to the Ephesians, which was probably meant to circulate to a bunch of different churches, uh, he, he, he knows that he has to address this issue. I mean, it's a thorny issue. He, he's, he knows he's probably going to face opposition from it no matter what, but he needs to address this. He knew that for the church to be effective, for the church to achieve its mission, for the church to move forward with what God wanted them to do, the issue of racial equality had to be dealt with. Paul knew that from the scriptures, God had created man and women in his own image. To, to steal a line from the U.S. Constitution, it says this, you might recognize this, that all people are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And, and so this, this, he knew that for the church to be what God called it to be, both Jews and Gentile believers in Jesus, they had to live together in community. They had to figure this thing out. And serving and living as equals, respecting one another, loving each other, showing the rest of the world, this is how, this is how the church acts. This is how the church behaves. This is what unity in community looks like. Now, let's go backwards here. Let's jump back to verse 1. It says this, As a prisoner of the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Now, we talked about the calling you've received, this, this mystery, right? The Jews and the Gentiles coming together. Now, as a prisoner of the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of this calling. Now, Paul literally He's literally a, 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 a prisoner, prisoner here. It's, 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 not, it's, not, it's not just that we need to talk about being equal. We need to actually act like we are equal. See, one of the implications of Paul's message is to compare, to compare how people lived before they were followers of Jesus compared to how they live now, which is interesting for us to think about. H how did you used to live before you gave your life to Jesus versus how you live now. Are there differences? Because there ought to be. But are there differences in how you behave, what you do? And Paul is calling them and calling us to a higher standard of living from where we once were. A higher standard in, in how we behave, how we belong, what we do, how we live. Certainly a higher standard than the rest of the world and the way that it lives. Now he starts with this phrase, with, 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 a, with, with a, uh, uh, kind of a phrase that we, he starts this verse with a phrase we hear a lot. He, he says this, a prisoner of the Lord, a prisoner of the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Now, a prisoner of the Lord, he, he makes reference to this quite often as he writes to the different churches. Now, literally, he is a prisoner as he's writing this. We, we know that he's actually chained to a Roman guard. Imagine that before he goes on trial before Caesar. He's literally writing this as he's chained to some guy. And he's, he's penning this out. He knew the charges against him were fake. He, he knew that it wasn't fair and that he was getting persecuted. And one of the saying Paul used to use a lot is that, is that we're no longer slaves to sin, but we are slaves to Christ. We are no longer slaves to sin, but a slave to Christ. Now, it's a bit, a bit of an oxymoron. Like, it doesn't seem to make sense when we talk about that, being a slave to sin or, or a slave to Christ. But Paul reminds us that our freedom, our freedom comes with a cost. Our freedom comes with a cost. I mean, yes, we have freedom in Jesus. We, we, we do. We have freedom in Jesus. And yet we choose to restrict that freedom for the sake of Jesus and for the sake of of others. Now, I, I know what this is like. I know we can boast about the freedoms that we have, the things that we can do, that there's no judgment or condemnation, but we live in a world of sin. For me and my family, I'm the pastor of this church, I live in a glass house. 
There are certain things that we restrict ourselves from doing because we know that we have a community that is watching us. We have a church who we, who we try to lead faithfully. And so we have to limit some of these things because we are not a slave to sin. We are a slave to Christ. And freedom does come at a cost. In order to keep the unity of community here, we need to, we need to restrict some things of how we live. They are, they are permissible, but they are not beneficial. And so this is an idea that he continues to drive home. The, the next thing that he says here is, is unity. He talks about unity with humility and unity with gentleness. Unity with humility, unity with gentleness. Now, this is in verse 2 and 3. Paul tells us how to live a life worthy of the calling that we have received. It says, it says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Now, I can imagine some of the issues that each side would have, would have had here with this church coming together. In, in our current state, in our society, we might even label it, uh, use the word privilege, all right? And that's a hot word right now, privileged. The Gentiles believers, the, 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 the Gentile believers, they, they were accepted into their culture. They could make things happen. They, they understood the society that they lived in. They fit in. They could make things happen. And so they were, they were a cultural privilege, right? The Jewish believers, they had a deep knowledge of scripture. And so they were almost spiritually privileged. Each had their category of what they knew and what they were kind of good at. And each side has, has reason to believe that they are better than the other. But Paul's instruction of humility and gentleness, he, he pleads, he pleads them, don't put yourself above the other. Live as equals. Serve one another. In fact, put the other side above you. Because if you're not careful, you stomp on others by the comments that you make. The things that you say when you claim that you're right all the time. Humility and gentleness, this is totally countercultural because, because in the Roman society, and I would, I would even go so far as to say in our society currently, humility and gentleness, they are not seen as virtues. Bullying and pressure and violence, th those, are, those are how peace Peace is achieved in, in society's view instead of through love. See, Paul's reminding us, he's reminding us of the way of the cross, the Sermon on the Mount. And in fact, Jesus says this in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit and the meek and the merciful and the pure in heart and the peacemakers. This is what Paul is calling us to live out, especially when we are, or if we are in the position of privilege. And it makes me think of all, of all the ugly and horrible things that have happened in our society, whether we want to talk about government issues, whether we want to talk about inequality, whether we want to talk about the income gap, whether we want to talk about the refugee crisis, and we want to talk about the, the worldwide pandemic. I mean, we could go on and on with hot topics that really could cause us to argue and, and, and to debate. But I, I just wonder if, if, if any of these things would, would have happened if people lived in community with gentleness and humbleness and put them into practice. It's easy to point the finger. It's easy, it's easy to lay blame. Lay blame and there's, there, there's plenty of blame to go around. We, we can blame people all day, but it's much harder to look in the mirror and to acknowledge your contribution into that. Be completely humble and gentle. Paul says it's not easy. This is hard work we got to do here. Hard work. There's rights, but rights come with responsibilities. And being a slave to Christ is being humble and gentle as you approach the church and the community and as you approach the world. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I don't want to blame the victim here. I don't want to point the finger. I'm, what I'm saying, though, is look at yourself. How do you contribute here? What, what, what is your position? 
Paul doesn't seem too interested in taking sides. His focus is on unity. It's not on division, but he says it starts right here. Be patient, Paul says. Bear with one another in love. Even when you've been wronged. Even when there are injustices. Paul knew it all too well. After all, his captor is right next to him as he writes this. It's not fair. It doesn't make sense. And Jesus, or James even reminds us of this. He says this in James 1, 2 to 3. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. J Jesus even tells us, turn the other cheek. It's not fair. It, it, it's not what you necessarily want, but it builds your faith. And then finally, he talks about the unity of the Spirit. Even when we're oppressed, Paul reminds us in this. In Ephesians uh, 4, 2-3, he says, Even when we are the oppressed, Paul reminds us to be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Through the bond of peace. Now, I don't, I don't have all the answers. I'm not smart enough to have all the answers. With all the, 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 the polarizing things that are happening in our society right now, even, even in the church, I don't have all the answers for those things. All I know is that it's not good, and it needs to change. It's not good, and it needs to change. What I do know is that it starts here. I often say I've never been able to change anybody, but I can, I can change myself, right? I can look and see how I contribute. What is my part in this? See, we should have something that the world doesn't have. The unity of the Spirit. The world doesn't have that. And so they need to fight for their rights. They need to fight for this. They need to take a stand. They need to do this. They need to. We have the unity of the Spirit. It's something that, 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 that no man can separate. I often say when I, when I marry two people, when I officiate a wedding, I will say that what God has bound together, let no man separate. And this church, our church, us, what God has brought together, no man can separate. And I believe that is exactly Paul's point here when it comes to the Jews and the Gentiles, this issue of, of reconciliation. God has called them together. And, and it, what he's saying here, Paul is saying the Spirit has brought you together. Don't, don't separate. Don't, don't be the cause of separation or division. Be, be unified in the Spirit. The idea that a group of strangers made up of all kinds of, of, of different people and different ages and different races and different economic status and different, different family backgrounds and different lives. I mean, all these people who normally would have absolutely no association with one another, who wouldn't even you know, connect at all, the idea that that group of people, a group of people that is totally diverse, could come together through the barriers that they have with each other. Nothing more in common than a professed faith in Jesus and held together by the Spirit. That kind of group would be an island of sanity in the midst of a crazy, crazy chaotic storm. It's totally countercultural. It doesn't make sense to the world. And so he ends this thing by talking about the unity of one. The unity of one. It's almost, it's almost musical as you, as you kind of read this. Here it goes in Ephesians 4, uh, 4 to 6. It says this, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. There are seven mentions of the word one here. Seven mentions, and Paul is just driving home this point. This point of unity, it is, it, is, it is tied up in the very nature of God. There's no room for division. There's no time for division. There's no room for separation. There's no room for inequality. He's talking about one, 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 one. Not multiple. He's talking about one. He's reminding us that the Jewish believers, they have the same spirit as, as the Gentile believers. You guys are all believing the same thing. 
And so put your preferences aside and be one, under one God and one spirit and one hope and one baptism. That's all in the name of Jesus. See, John says this in Revelation 4, 8. It says, says this, was and is and is to come. The name of Jesus is proclaimed all throughout in the beginning and the end and all through the middle. And, and the one in the words of Peter in Acts 4.12 says this, there's no other name under heaven given to mankind which we must be saved. This idea of the one, the one is Jesus, united under the one. Now I'm thankful for our community here at Southgate. And, and sometimes, oftentimes, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. Because I, that, that, I know that we get this. I know that we understand this. And I had the great privilege of, of coming, joining this community almost 12 years ago now. And to be a part of, of a vibrant community who, who, who for the most part, not always, but for the most part, can come together and do amazing things in the name of Jesus. And show the world, no matter what happens, no matter who throws, shoots arrows at us, no matter what kind of, kind of person tries to divide the church, no, no matter what takes place, this community of believers is one under Jesus. And no matter how diverse we are, different beliefs and backgrounds and situations and, and whatever, that we could come together and, 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 and for the sake of Christ, be a slave to Christ and turn our differences into being one under the Spirit. Now, I don't, want to, I don't want to ever say that we've arrived because I don't think we have. But as long as there's things happening in the world, that there's divisions taking place, that there's injustices and all kinds of, of difficult, chaotic situations, if we could stand as one in the midst of that, that in and of itself is a witness. So let's go back to the comment I, I made earlier, just, a, just as a bottom line here. And I just want you to think about this. See, Paul knew that for the church to be what God called it to be, both Jewish and Gentile believers, and Jesus had to, had to live together in community as equals. Everybody's the same. Serving and respecting each other. Differences of opinion. Differences of, of theology. D differences of, of thought and, 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 and things that you, you have a passion for and, and desires. Showing to the rest of the world, this is how you behave. This is how you act. This is a glimpse of heaven. Coming together under one. So a few things I jotted down. I know I had one of these points here last week as a next step. Just think it's vitally important, especially when, we're, when we've been not living so much in community over the past 18 months. Here's an opportunity for you to jump in. Connect with a life class. We're not pushing small groups this year. We are pushing these life classes, these smaller kind of communities that we can jump into. There's going to be a variety of these classes that you can sign up online to join in and uh, all kinds of different options and scenarios. We're also going to have online Zoom options. And so you can join a community um, and, and jump into different topics and studies. And we think this will be really good. Or join a ministry. Find unity and community by serving. Be, be, be volunteer to, to sign up to, to serve the kids or serve youth or young adults or, or, or be a greeter or, or, or serve on outreach or mission. I mean, whatever it is, jump in here in ministry and serve in community. Second thing, take a moment and be real with yourself. Take a moment here. Ask yourself, what am I doing to add value? To add value to the unity of the body. Not, not to, what am I doing to, to, to say that I'm right? What am I doing to prove someone else wrong? What am I doing to try to get other people in the same mindset that I'm thinking? What am I doing to, to, to kind of put down the other side? No, nothing like that. What am I doing to add value? What's the last time you did, you did something to add value to the unity of the body here at Southgate? Just be real with yourself. Because I think if we're honest, we, we do have some work to do. And the, great, the best days, the greatest days, I, I sincerely believe it are ahead of us. And it's hard sometimes in the moment to, to think that or believe that, but I think if we can come together, God is going to do something great in 
and through his body right here at Southgate. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, uh, at times, God, if we're honest, there's times when we are absolutely selfish, where we absolutely are, are just trying to get our way with what we, what we think ought to be happening or going on or, or what we should be doing or shouldn't be doing, what we should be believing, what we shouldn't be believing, God. Father, we, we just want to lay all those things down here. We, we are praying for something supernatural to take place, something that we, that we honestly we can't do on our own as, 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 as sinful, as, as flawed people. But God, we also know that we are your children and we believe in the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. And God, we are praying for the Spirit to breathe life into our church, into our community, Father. That in the midst of a chaotic world, we would be more united in community than we ever have been in the past. God, do something in us and through us that would blow us away, that would be a witness not only to us, but the world in which we live. Father, we surrender ourselves to you. Use us, we plead, and we pray. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this week. I'm Pastor Kevin, and I just want to take a little bit of time to unpack what we just heard in uh, Pastor Ben's message. And we were talking about unity and what we as followers of Jesus are called to do to bring about unity in the church, unity in our community. And uh, and I want to I want to say and I want to emphasize that that unity doesn't always mean uniformity. It doesn't mean that we all have to be the same. Um, But how can we be challenged this week and in the coming weeks to bring about unity? And, uh, you know, Pastor Ben pointed out that we live in a world that is so, so divided. How can we inject some unity there? And uh, I always think about Jesus in some of his last moments before he's arrested. Um, uh, Peter actually gets up to start a fight and Jesus tells him to stop. And his response to Peter is actually, don't you think that I could call on legions of angels to come and fight for me? And what Jesus is trying to say here is that I have every right to get out of the situation that I'm in, but for the sake of serving and loving other people, I will lay down my rights and I will allow suffering to happen to me. And I think when we look at Jesus this way and we think about our life, we can find a key to unity without necessarily meaning uniformity. It doesn't mean that you have to change everything from the core of who you are. What it does mean is that we have to be challenged in what ways can we sacrifice things that we believe are um, are our rights and what are some of the things that we can put down, lay aside for the sake of others. And so that's my challenge to you this week as we think about uh, bringing about unity both in the church and in our greater communities. What are some of the things that you are holding on to? What are some of the rights that you are holding on to that you can actually lay down for the sake of someone else? Uh, We live in a world that is full of uh, thinking about ourselves and how we can make things work for us. Instead, this week, I want you to ask yourself, what are some of the privileges that you enjoy and how can you set those aside to serve other people? And I think what you'll find is that we have a greater sense of unity and togetherness, even if we don't see uniformity. And so I want to challenge you with that this week. I want to challenge myself with that this week. Uh, There are so many times that we uh, just don't look like Jesus in these situations. And so I want to challenge you to look to Jesus and see how he behaves in these situations. And let's try to imitate him in everything that we do. 
Thank you once again for joining us and I hope to see you again next week.